I want to introduce tonight's speaker, Mike Weber. Mike is a popular returning speaker for the museum, and he has a long history and love of Cornwall. As a child, he collected rock and mineral specimens from in and around the waste rock piles, and that led him to the study of geology. As a 1982 geoscience graduate from Penn State, Mike worked for 36 years as a geologist, health physicist, and manager for the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the U.S. Geological Survey. After retiring from federal service, he returned to Cornwall Furnace, where he serves as a guide and researches the history of mining and geology at Cornwall and similar posits in Pennsylvania. One of Mike's ongoing research projects is studying the records of the Cornwall Division of Bethlehem Steel, which he is turning into a book called Always More Production. So please welcome our speaker, Mike Weber. Good evening and thanks for that introduction, Mike. And thanks for all of our audience for joining us tonight for this webinar on the safety of Cornwall mines and mills. Uh, as Mike introduced me, I'm Mike Weber and it's my pleasure to present to you this evening. I also wanna thank the Friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace for sponsoring this webinar and especially to Mike Emery, our host tonight and Cornwall site administrator and Kathy Donaldson, secretary of the Cornwall Iron Furnace Associates. For my presentation this evening, I will be drawing on my background as a health and safety regulator, as well as on the research that Mike mentioned about iron mining at Cornwall. Ah, had to wake up my mouse there. After a brief introduction to mining and uh, mining safety in particular, I will review government oversight of mining safety, discuss the fatalities that are known to have occurred in Cornwall mines, and summarize the safety programs at Cornwall. And I'll end my presentation by sharing several safety stories involving dramatic events. I plan to leave time at the end of my presentation to answer your questions and to listen to your comments. Now, mining has always been a precarious occupation. For many years, miners, including young boys, like you see on the slide, eight to 14 years old, risk their lives and limbs daily in mining. We do not know much about the safety of the Cornwall mines during their first 125 years of operation. However, the records during the last 110 years of Cornwall are much more complete and describe a range of activities that help to protect the miners and the millers. Of course, we will never know how many miners and their families were saved from or protected by the safety measures that were used in the mines and the mills. Unfortunately, these measures did not always guarantee safety. Miners and millers died and were severely injured at Cornwall. We mourn for their losses and the sacrifices of the miners and the millers over the years who were killed or injured while working in the mines. So what is safety? If we polled our audience tonight, we would likely come up with a range of definitions of this term. Now, as important as safety may be to us, I expect it was even more important to the miners and the millers of Cornwall who risked their lives to earn a living and make our nation strong and prosperous. I will be using the term safety as the protection from death, injury, or hazardous conditions. Safety programs seek to maintain life, avoid serious injuries that maim or cause a loss of work, and avoid less serious injuries that require medical care. Safety generally means avoiding prompt or acute injuries like severe accidents that can cause death. Of course, we also recognize that safety and health form a continuum in protecting against longer term or more chronic impairment of human health. That green cross at the top of the slide is often used as a symbol of safety. Mining safety is more specifically the protection against hazards associated with the extraction and processing of minerals from the earth. The hazards include those listed on this slide, including rock falls, explosions, fires, and suffocation. It's one thing to discuss mining safety in the abstract, 
but it is a much larger challenge to achieve mining safety in a real operating mine. So far, civilization has not been able to achieve absolute safety or zero risk while mining. Consequently, mining safety attempts to minimize risk. By risk, I'm referring to potential adverse consequences and the likelihood that one or more miners will be exposed to a hazard that can cause these adverse consequences. As I've already mentioned, these adverse consequences are caused by a variety of hazards. This slide includes a more complete list of the hazards that are associated with mining, both the surface mining, such as the open pit, as well as the underground or deep mining that occurred in the number three and number four mines at Cornwall. Because we cannot achieve absolute safety, most mining safety programs attempt to minimize risk associated with these hazards while economically producing the earth materials that are the objective of the mining. Safety is accomplished by using a variety of strategies. First, eliminating the risk by avoiding the hazard. As an example of this strategy, it might be using electric miners lamps instead of carbide lamps with their lit flames to reduce fire and explosion risks. Second, controlling the risk at the source, such as in removing excess grease and other combustible fluids from electric tramming locomotives used underground. Third, minimizing the risks more globally by limiting the amount of combustible materials that are taken into the mines like paper, wood, and packing materials. And finally, using personal protective equipment, such as safety shoes and boots. Now, during the pandemic, we've all become much more familiar with personal protective equipment, or PPE, such as masks, face shields, and gloves. Many occupations today, in fact, use PPE to reduce, but not to eliminate, risks from hazards. In addition to using these four general strategies, Mining safety also employs various safety practices that are listed on this slide, which I took from the International Labor Organization's Handbook on Mining Safety. Examples of these safety practices include installing chains across openings to warn against fall hazards, as you can see in that upper photograph of the Cornwall mines of 1951. Another is ventilating mines to ensure fresh air and avoid the buildup of toxic or suffocating gases, as you see in the lower photograph with the ventilation fan in 1952. And then using ropes and safety harnesses while operating at elevated positions. These safety practices were actively used at Cornwall, especially during the last 75 years of the operation of the mines. The companies that operated the mines at Cornwall took these precautions to protect the miners. Safety made business sense for a variety of reasons, including operational, ethical, and economical benefits. However, not all mining operators were initially as motivated to achieve a high level of safety. More than 10,000 miners died, for example, in the anthracite mines in northeastern Pennsylvania during the last four decades of the 19th century, 10,000 miners. With the significant growth of coal mining during this period, Pennsylvania became the first state to pass legislation to help ensure the safety of coal miners in April 1869. Unfortunately, these controls only applied in one county, that was Schuylkill County, and to one type of mine, anthracite mines. In addition, enforcement of these controls was lax to non-existent. Pennsylvania's legislature strengthened these controls in 1870 following the mining disaster that occurred at the Avondale mine in September of 1869. That disaster killed 110 miners, including children, as well as some of the rescuers. After another series of mine disasters occurred in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Illinois, and killed thousands of miners between 1907 and 1909, the federal government strengthened regulation of mining safety beginning in 1910. As federal regulation tightened, states gradually yielded their controls throughout the 20th century. Specific to mining at Cornwall, 
It's important to note that the first law governing metal mining was enacted in 1966. Consequently, for most of Cornwall's 236 years of mining, no specific regulatory controls or oversight applied to mining safety at the federal level. Of course, there were other controls on narrower aspects of the operation, including explosive safety and operating cranes and hoists. The combination of practices and strategies applied by the miners and the companies who operated the mines, as well as regulatory oversight, effectively reduced the fatalities from metal and non-metal mining in the United States during the past century. As you see in this graph using data from the Mine Safety and Health Administration, annual fatality rates that once totaled as high as a thousand have been reduced to single digits. The data include mineral processing as well as processing of sand and gravel. Although fatality rates in coal mining remain above those for metal and non-metal mining, Coal miners and their companies that operate the mines have successfully reduced fatality rates to levels that are far lower than they were in the latter part of the 19th and early 20th century. Now, despite the efforts of the miners and the mining companies, about 40 fatalities reportedly occurred in the mines and the mills of Cornwall. In my research, I found records associated with 28 deaths from accidents on the job between 1879 and 1969. The deaths were a small fraction of the severe injuries that occurred at Cornwall, which often led to amputations and permanent disabilities during the late 1800s and early 1900s. Most of the fatalities occurred in and around the mines, while a few occurred at the concentrator plant in Lebanon. 11 fatal accidents were caused by rock falls in the open pit and the underground mines. Six fatalities were caused by the machines that were used by the miners, including locomotives and skip hoists. As you see in the picture on the left part of this slide, George Huber died in April 1951 when he was crushed in the spot where the man standing against a timber set by a tramming train on the 700 foot level haulage of the number four mine. The other 11 fatalities on this slide included explosions or were caused by explosions, fires, projectiles, and a range of other causes. We honor the supreme sacrifices made by the miners who died or were severely injured at the mines, along with their families who lost husbands, fathers, grandfathers, uncles, brothers, and sons. To reduce the risks of mining, the operators of the mines took a variety of actions to protect the miners. The earliest safety records that we have for Cornwall were from the Cornwall Ore Bank Company from 1864 through 1917. Records indicate that the company valued the miners and millers and took actions to improve their safety and quality of life. These actions included avoiding dangerous practices, such as prohibiting drilling into holes that were still loaded with explosives, so-called missed holes. These prohibitions were communicated through standing orders, much like in the military. Other actions included use of on-the-job training, compensating families for their losses when workers were killed or severely injured, improving the quality of medical care for the miners, and providing the miners and their families quality housing at low rents. This tradition of protecting miners and millers continued after Bethlehem Steel acquired a majority stake in the mines in 1916 through mine closure in 1973. Here you can see a picture of the Cornwall Safety Department in 1953. Bethlehem Steel managed safety comprehensively for decades, long before safety requirements were imposed on the operations by state or federal regulation. Some of this safety focus was reinforced by labor management tensions. Bethlehem Steel Corporation did not support organized labor before World War II. By demonstrating care and concern for the safety of the workers, Bethlehem Steel attempted to achieve the operational, economical, and ethical benefits of safety while undermining support for unions among the workforce. The safety program featured many of the strategies and practices that we previously discussed. 
By the late 1960s, in fact, more injuries resulting in a loss of work time occurred away from work than occurred on the job. For example, in August 1966, Alvin Ditzler received multiple fractures when he was pinned to the ground by the fall of a large chunk of ore on the 10-10 foot level of the number four mine. That same month, the safety department reported four accidents that occurred off the job and resulted in a loss of work time. These included an employee who slipped on a beer keg and sprained his ankle, another employee who received a concussion and head laceration while wrestling with his son, another employee who fell down the stairs at his home and sprained his back and ribs, and an employee who lacerated his head and fractured his right leg in an automobile accident. By 1970, off-the-job injuries greatly exceeded work time losses, especially from automobile accidents. Now, of the safety strategies used by Bethlehem Steel, the company required wearing personal protective equipment, or PPE, including gloves, hard hats, electric lamps, safety shoes and boots, eye protection, and hearing and respiratory protection while drilling. Although eye protection became mandatory in June 1939, some workers continued to resist the use of safety goggles and glasses well into the 1950s. A wildcat strike was called by the local chapter of the United Mine Workers Union in October of 1953 over the mandatory use of eye protection, and the issue was promptly settled. The safety department continued to encourage the miners and millers to wear eye protection until the mines closed in 1972 and 1973. From today's perspective, it may seem that Cornwall was slow to adopt these common sense safety measures. However, Bethlehem Steel was a leader in using and requiring protective equipment and other safety measures. Another safety strategy that was used by Bethlehem Steel was to ensure that all workers received general safety training as well as specialized training that they needed for their jobs. Workers received safety training or indoctrination when they first entered the workforce at Cornwall. And as they progressed in their jobs, they received additional on-the-job training for the tasks for which they were assigned. Specialized training included certification programs, for example, in using explosives, operating cranes and hoists, and conducting electrical repairs. Bethlehem Steel frequently partnered with federal and state agencies <clears throat> in conducting the training, such as the mine rescue training offered by the U.S. Bureau of Mines, as seen in this picture from 1968. Each employee was responsible con to conduct their work safely and to avoid careless behavior. Bethlehem established a comprehensive safety oversight program to reinforce and support safe operations. Superintendents and foremen were responsible for ensuring that workers used safe practices. Foremen distributed company safety manuals to the workers and shared their concerns and suggestions with the safety committees that functioned in each department, as well as the site-wide safety committee that oversaw safety throughout the Cornwall division. In the late 1940s, Cornwall appointed a safety engineer and established a safety department. Inspectors from this department conducted weekly inspections and observations of site activities. Reports from the safety department were included in the monthly operating reports from 1951 until the Cornwall mines closed in 1973. In addition to site safety oversight, Bethlehem Steel Corporation provided corporate oversight of safety at Cornwall and conducted audits of the safety program. Insurance companies conducted independent inspections and audits with heightened attention to fire safety and liabilities. Further, state and federal agencies oversaw safety activities, conducted routine and for-cause inspections, and reviewed accident reports and annual summaries to help ensure safe operations of the mines and the mills. <clears throat> of course, safety at the mines and mills was profoundly impacted by the actions and the decisions of the leaders of the organization, both leaders who were on site and leaders at corporate headquarters in Bethlehem. Cornwall emphasized personal accountability for the safety of operations. From an organizational standpoint, authority and responsibility for safety were vested in the general manager of the Cornwall division. 
This responsibility then cascaded down the organizational structure through superintendents, mining captains, department heads, managers, frontline supervisors, and foremen. General managers such as Shelley Shale demonstrated their personal commitment to safety through involving themselves in helping to ensure the safety of the miners and the other workers, modeling safe work practices, and recognizing exemplary safety performance. On the left of this slide, you see the organizational chart in 1949, which includes the safety engineer who at the time was Charlie Neal and who reported directly to the general manager of Cornwall. In the photo on the right, the employees of the number four mine are receiving the Sentinels of Safety Award from the US Bureau of Mines and the American Mining Congress in 1966 for their exemplary safety performance. In addition, Cornwall enhanced safety awareness of all the workers through a comprehensive communication program that featured signs, exhibits, posters, special in-house initiatives, staff meetings and presentations, safety competitions, and community safety programs. We'll briefly cover these programs in the next several slides. This slide shows an example of a safety sign that was featured prominently as the miners exited the dry house for the number four mine. When they looked at the clock before exiting the change room, they were reminded that now is the time to be careful. Of course, no matter what time showed on the clock face, it was always time to be careful. These photos show two exhibits of the safety equipment used by the miners, with a display for the miners of the number four mine on the right from the 1950s, and for the number three mine on the left from 1966. The miners were no doubt already familiar with each of these safety measures, but the visual display in a showcased setting helped remind them why they wore this equipment and how it helped to keep them safe while working. Another prominent reminder of safety and safe work practices were the posters displayed at the entrance to the number four mine near the number four shaft, near the head frame of the number three mine and at the concentrator plant. Cornwall displayed these posters from 1946 until mining operations closed down. Most of the posters were distributed by the congressionally chartered National Safety Council. The council continued communicating some of the same themes on worker safety that were initially illustrated and communicated by the Works Progress Administration or the WPA. Bethlehem Steel Corporation occasionally developed and distributed in-house posters reminding the miners of their important duties during World War II and the Korean conflict. Cornwall management included photos of the safety posters in the monthly operational reports they submitted to corporate headquarters. From time to time, Cornwall took on special initiatives to highlight safety topics such as eye protection. As we've already discussed, Cornwall required eye protection beginning in 1939, yet compliance was still lagging by the early 1950s. Cornwall Safety Department highlighted monthly success stories where safety goggles and glasses prevented a loss of sight and protected workers at the mines and the concentrator. The sign on the left featured glowing light bulbs with the expression, don't be a schmo, keep both eyes aglow, wear goggles. According to the dictionary, a schmo is a stupid or foolish person. The poster on the right features Carl Fake's success story in 1968, when the tip of a pick broke off, flew into the air, and shattered Carl's right lens. His eyesight was saved. <coughs> Excuse me. During the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, Cornwall routinely showed slides, film strips, and movies that featured safety topics and staff meetings. These meetings included workers at the mines and the concentrator. In this photo on the left, you see miners underground in the number four mine watching a slideshow about the importance of barring down or knocking down rocks from overhead before entering an area underground. This was an especially important safety matter at Cornwall and at other underground mines. As you see in the photo on the right, of two miners barring it down on the seventh level of the number three mine. Cornwall and Bethlehem Steel also encouraged safety through participating in local and national safety competitions. For example, as you see in the photo on the left, 
Cornwall participated in first aid competitions among the divisions of Bethlehem Steel beginning in 1949. The first several of these competitions were in fact conducted at the concentrator plant in Lebanon. Cornwall fielded teams from both the number three and the number four mines and the concentrator and routinely placed very well in the competitions. In the photo on the right, the miners of the number four mine received the Sentinels of Safety Award for exemplary safety performance in underground mining in 1966 from the Bureau of Mines and the American Mining Congress. This was one of several national awards that were won by the employees of the Cornwall Division over the years. Cornwall focused on safety outside the workplace and in the communities surrounding Cornwall and Lebanon. After training workers on first aid and cardiopulmonary resuscitation, Cornwall offered the training to hundreds of people at Cornwall High School and through the YMCA, the Girl Scouts, and the Boy Scouts. Cornwall also conducted drives for tuberculosis screening, blood donations, and determining blood type among workers and local residents. In addition to gaining prominence as a good neighbor, these community programs also help to remind workers of the importance of safety both on and off the job. Now, as I wind down my presentation, I thought it'd be useful to share several specific safety stories that illustrate Cornwall's approach to safety, especially when they occurred in response to some dramatic events. Our first story involves the collapse of the land surface over top of the number four mine. Although mining of the number four mine began in the 1920s, full-scale production of ore did not begin until 1938. This mine was one of the two underground or deep mines of Cornwall, the other one being the number three mine beneath the floor of the open pit. Now the ore body at the number four mine extended from a depth of 150 feet to 12,025 feet below the surface. As miners removed the iron ore underground, large cavities formed in the space where the ore previously existed. And in time, the rocks above these cavities collapsed downward. As collapse continued, the resulting cavities gradually and sometimes suddenly migrated to the surface. This occurred in February 1939, when a 150 foot diameter crater formed on the land surface above the number four mine in a couple of days. In the photo on the right, you can see a miner in that red circle standing at the rim of the crater for scale. The map on the left of the slide shows the plan map of the number four mine with a yellow circle denoting the size of the crater at the land surface. For over 200 years up until this point, most of the mining at Cornwall had occurred in surface mines beneath Big Hill, Middle Hill, and Grassy Hill. But the deep mines were different. They were covered by hundreds of feet of rock and soil. Consequently, the miners who worked in the number four and the number three mines feared the collapse of rock above the mines as they excavated the ore from below. What would happen when the rock above collapsed? Would it cause explosions, catastrophic collapse, water flooding? How would they remain safe? When the surface collapsed and the crater formed in February 1939, no immediate or catastrophic consequences occurred. The lack of large rock falls, air blasts, drift collapse, or severe flooding helped to relieve some of the fear among the operators of the mines and the miners. However, General Manager A.F. Peterson exaggerated the relief when he stated, quote, there is now greater confidence among the operators of the number four mine that the back will never become a menace in any section of the workings, end quote. The back or ceiling of the mine, of course, continued to be a menace in both the number four and the number three mines over the next 35 years. Chunks of ore continued to fall on the miners, causing significant injuries as well as fatalities. This is the reason why barring it down was such an important safety strategy at Cornwall. Even after taking appropriate safety precautions, sometimes the rocks would seemingly and randomly fall on the miners, causing injury and death. Since the introduction of locomotives and other large machines at Cornwall in the 1850s, a variety of serious and disabling injuries and deaths were caused by these large and powerful devices. Trains, both above and below ground, skip hoists, 
crushers, steam and air drills, steam and electric shovels, and diesel trucks and shovels posed additional risks of injuries to the miners, even though these machines were indispensable in excavating and hauling and processing the ore and rock out of the mines. For instance, there was the wreck of locomotive number nine in November, 1943. The accident occurred on November 19th when the locomotive lost its brakes while pulling waste rock out of the pit. An engineer initially regained control of the train, but subsequently lost control when the brakes failed again. Locomotive number nine, along with its tender and two stripping cars, drifted back down the tracks towards the western end of the open pit. The engineer and crew leapt off the train before the locomotive and its tender rolled over and off the tracks. The stripping cars continued to roll on the rails until they collided with two cars being pulled in the opposite direction by locomotive 19. The good news in how this story ended was that no one was injured other than some bruises, aches, and pains among the crew. Moving into the 1950s, there's the famous story of how the miners were saved by Melvin Fiddler's baked potatoes. Significant inflow of water into the underground mines and occasionally the open pit hampered ore production since the early 1900s. At 7.15 p.m. on July 24th, 1957, over 6,000 tons of mud and debris surged into the number four mine, flooding multiple levels impeding operations for five days and requiring about six months to clean up. The muck that flooded the mines came from the land surface. It contained red sand and clay, as well as tree limbs and stumps up to 10 feet long and eight inches in diameter. The muck traveled a distance of more than 1300 feet from the land surface down to the 760 and 820 level haulage drifts the 880 level ore slot, and the 945 foot level cleaning raises and drifts. Fortunately, the miners were eating supper at the time of the flood and were safely sheltered in lunchrooms underground. Some of the miners had baked potatoes on the radiators in the lunchroom before dinner. It is likely that the flooding would have injured or killed the miners if they had not been eating at the time of the flood. Ironically, the safety poster for that month featured a man floating in an inner tube stating, on holidays, forget cares, but not caution. Accidents continued to occur until mining and milling ceased at Cornwall. On the morning of October 5th, 1966, for example, the ore skip car jammed into the head frame of the number four shaft of the number four mine. The accident was caused by both an inattentive operator and the failure of a safety device, the overspeed tipple approach mechanism. When the skip car jammed into the head frame, the hoist cable that lifted and lowered the skips snapped and whipped over the hoist house, slicing through the power lines and causing a power failure that lasted for about a day. No one was injured in this accident, which is fortunate, noting how easily the hoist cable sliced through the power lines and caused extensive damage. You can see the severed power lines on the right-hand side there in that photograph, the back of the hoist house. These are but a handful of stories from the 236 years of mining and milling at Cornwall, stories that tell us about the risks faced by the miners and millers, as well as the precautions and actions they took to achieve safety and reduce injuries and accidents. Although far from foolproof, these actions generally succeeded in keeping most of the miners and millers safe and secure from harm. As I bring my presentation to a close and prepare for your questions and comments, I think it's only fitting to note that the miners at Cornwall not only focused on their own safety, but also sometimes on the safety of the animals that lived around them. For example, when a young deer was found wandering around underground in the number three mine in January, 1968, the miners rescued the doe, brought her to the surface and safely released her back into the nearby woods. I wanna thank you for your attention and for the opportunity to present to you this evening. I would also like to thank the friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace and especially Mike Emery, site administrator and tonight's host 
as well as Kathy Donaldson, Secretary of the Friends, and our webinar host, Behind the Scenes. Now I'd be happy to answer your questions or listen to your comments. Stay safe out there. I thank you very much, Mike. Uh, one of the pieces that we had come in is that we have a descendant, actually, of one of the miners who was killed in the, uh, the Cornwall mine, a man by the name of Samuel Brewer, uh, who I believe died in 1924. And uh, the story that comes from uh, Elizabeth Brewer, I believe is a person who put this in, yes, uh, is that they didn't think that the uh, the Bethlehem Steel was overly uh, generous in the amount of uh, financial support that they gave, uh, though I'm sure that you know over time that varied uh, from time to time. Uh, but she states that her father was was 13 years old at the time that that her fa uh, grandfather passed. Wow. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, that is a very tragic and. Uh, and I looked, he did buried over here in, in uh, the Cornwall Cemetery. Hmm. And uh, on the gravestone, it says that he was born in Cornwall, England, and then died here in Cornwall, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. So. Uh, Samuel Brewer, was that his name? Correct. Uh, that's interesting because I didn't have record of his loss. Well, like I said, I think it's in 1924. Yeah. So those are some of the records, as you know, Mike, we don't have at the Absolutely. first. So. That's that kind of dark period in our records. So that's yeah. uh, another one of those 40 people, Mike, that uh, you had heard about, but, but uh, one which we didn't see. So, yeah, so thank you for sharing that. All right. So uh, we have a question here. How old were children who worked in the mines? So at Cornwall uh, in the 20th century, of course, children were not working in the mines. Uh, we do have records of children uh, 10, 12, 14 years old who worked in the uh, surface mines, uh, principally carrying water around to keep the miners uh, hydrated while they were working and also learning the skills so that as they became sufficiently old to begin working a, a full day, uh, you know, they were skilled and ready to go uh, and uh, employed in working in the mines. Yes, I, I know that in the, that bi autobiography that Dewey Bernard uh, did, now, I think he talks about that he started when he was around 12 mm -hmm. as a water boy in, in the mine. And then, you know, that kind of gave him entree that as he got older to then move up and, and to move into different jobs. And, you know, eventually, you know, had what, about a 50 year career uh, at, at Cornwall. So, yeah, Dewey was quite an accomplished uh, miner, as you point out, starting as a water boy and ending up, uh, he ran the timber department for a while. Uh, and then after uh, he left Cornwall, he continued to work for Cornwall Borough and for the school district in Cornwall. Uh, so he had a lot of different responsibilities and uh, acquired a lot of knowledge uh, during his years of service at, at Cornwall. All right. Uh, we have another question that came in. Is the hoist house at number four mine still standing? Uh, yes, it is. Okay. Uh, it's been uh, vandalized by people over the years. There's a lot of spray paint on the walls and a lot of broken windows, and the ceiling is starting to cave in in places in the hoist house, uh, but it is still standing. All right. Uh... It said, uh, this is a question from Eric. It says, uh, hi, Mike, relating to your slide number 29, uh, the use of the term muck, uh, is that an official geological uh, term or, or is it more mining vernacular? Uh, he said that his Pennsylvania Dutch uh, grandfather used the word schmutz, of course, <laughs> uh, in, instead of muck. Yeah, so muck is a term that's uh, often used by miners. Uh, there are miners who work underground and they're called muckers. 
because their job is to scoop up this uh, mix of uh, rock and mud and silt and water. And that all constitutes, if you can see where I'm circling there, that all constitutes muck in mining terms. It's not a geologic term. <laughs> okay. So that's not anything that you learned at Penn State, huh? Well, I did learn it at Penn State, but I learned it uh, from the mining engineers, not from the geologists. Not from the geologists. Yeah. All right. All right. I think the geologists would have been much more uh, descriptive about what exactly they meant by muck. What, what actually the muck contained. And yeah, they probably would have cited grain size distributions and okay. uh, classed shapes and all sorts of things like that. Uh, we have another uh, woman, Marie, who said that her father was a Bethlehem Steel physician in the 60s to early 70s and saw some really odd plant injuries. Uh, I'm sure. Was that uh, Dr. Brubaker? Um, she doesn't have that on here. So uh, okay. Marie, if you're still listening, if you could say uh, what your father's name was. Oh, Dr. Howard. Oh, Dr. Howard. Okay. Okay. Yes, uh, you know, whenever there was a significant accident uh, on the job, either at the mines or the mills, uh, Bethlehem Steel would call in the uh, attending physician. Um, and, you know, they would be consulted with respect to the seriousness of the injuries, as well as any first aid that needed to be rendered. Uh, sometimes they met the individuals who were injured at the hospital uh, depending on the nature of the uh, the injuries, but uh, I'm sure uh, they saw a, a number of interesting uh, injuries over the years. Oh, absolutely! You know that's the one thing with very big equipment in an industrial area. There are just all kinds of things that one just sees uh, and that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so. We have uh, a clarification. We're talking about uh, uh, Samuel Brewer. Uh, the death was in 1928, not 1924. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Well, I was a little off by that. Sorry about that. No, no problem. Thank you. Do, uh, do we know how Samuel died? I, I will get that to you, Mike. I looked at the, the death uh, okay. certificate, and it does give a little detail on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Yes, Marie says uh, that her father saw a back injury due to getting a thumb stuck in an elevator. So that is a pretty odd injury. Wow. As a person who works in state government, that is an injury report I would not want to fill out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it didn't feel good to the person who was injured. No, not at all. Okay. So we also have... Uh, this is Elizabeth Brewer stating again that when she was in college, 1966 to 1970, Bethlehem Steel would hire uh, college guys to be the mucker for summers. So, yes, <laughs> okay. that's one of the skills, uh, or that's one of the occupations that requires less skill. Uh, so people could walk into that job with some basic preparation and training, safety training. Um, I'm sure the older miners also chuckled that these college uh, students were having to do the dirty work, so to speak, in the mine. I'm sure there was a couple of smiles or chuckles over that. <laughs> yeah. I, I worked one summer as a general laborer for a construction company, and I usually ended up with the... Uh, the dirtier and the hotter jobs. <laughs> I understand that completely as well. <laughs> so uh, right now, Mike, that looks to be all of the questions that came in. So uh, I think then uh, so that I will go ahead and, and wrap things up. Okay. All right. So, well, thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us uh, for this lecture. I especially want to thank Mike Weber for his presentation and for Kathy Donaldson for helping us to organize our virtual talk. I also want to thank the friends of the Cornwall Iron Furnace who sponsored this program. 
If you or your business would like to sponsor a future lecture, please contact the site for further information. And of course, donations are gladly accepted. So please join us for our next lecture on Tuesday, November 9th, uh, which will talk about the history of Lebanon's water supply. Uh, and that will be conducted by Cornwall Iron Furnaces, uh, uh, the Furnace Associates Vice President, uh, who is also a local historian and educator, uh, Mike Trump. So again, that will be on the, the 9th of October. Uh, we also, uh, finishing out the year uh, in December, we will have a talk on the railroads of Cornwall. So mm -hmm. more information about that will be coming out in just a few of the coming weeks. So just a reminder that the museum is now open Friday through Sunday. And please check our website for details and for tour information. So with that, uh, have a good night. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please uh, stay safe. And uh, we hope to see you soon sometime at the museum. So good night.